It's the Cold Beer Surf Club. <laughs> Not saying too much. My son will be bigger than me in like two years. Oh my God, dude. They grow up so fast. It's crazy, huh? Yeah. The crew's already tapping in, trying to get the Wi-Fi. Yeah, dude. Don't mess around. Like, <laughs> so, Dad, you brought me down here. You're just going to leave me over here on this couch. His mom and his and his brothers and and my oldest 17 year old and his, and his girlfriend they all went to Hawaii already this, oh no way this morning oh wow thanks for hanging they were all gonna come on my flight yeah and then they were like oh, I really wanna just go and like be there already dad and I'm like <laughs> bail then yeah go dude that's crazy your oldest is 17 dude he's 17 holy crap his girlfriend car crazy He's actually coming home early from Hawaii because he's got a modeling job. Oh, sick. He, like, makes money. Rad. It's kind of heavy. That's killer. He's, like, super, like, unique looking, handsome, yeah. and, like, just, like, just, he's got bank, <laughs> he's got a bank account full of money. <laughs> Trying to tell him to get a job. He's like, I have one, Dad. And I'm like, yeah. Yeah, but like you don't really work, and, and he's like, no, I work. I go and I'm like there, and I'm doing my like every day. Like I, when I work, I'm like in, in engaged and doing it, and I'm like, all right, but like he's like, and I'll make more money in like one day than I will for like the whole summer, <laughs> working at a coffee shop. And, and he just like rouses me, you know. Yeah. And I'm just like, like, why would I do that? <laughs> trying to like give him like some structure. Yeah. But it's like impossible. That's so sick. These days. The world changes, man, so fast. Dude, so it does. Now I'm just like, just go with it. Just, now he just came out of the asshole phase. Oh yeah. And country is in the asshole phase. <laughs> so he's like, 15 and just like, nightmare. So what's the asshole phase? It's when you come into knowing everything. Yeah. And I think I'm still in the <laughs> knowing everything. <laughs> not really showing any signs of affection or mis need for your like parents yeah and like pretty much pushing back on everything you could possibly push on like can you take out the trash no why did why isn't coast doing that uh, oh yeah do you know like and then like just ev there's everything like and and then the tone of voice and then the way that they talk to you about like they think you're their you're their friend and the way that they talk to their friends is outrageous. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And you're just like, no, 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 no. <laughs> like, I have to constantly, like, check and remind and, like, fold. Yet, like, dude, you just wait. <laughs> it's so crazy. Oh, man. What but did I get myself into? His, like, now his form of affection is to hit me, <laughs> to fight, to wrestle. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. And... As strong as he is, like you're always like a little bit fat, like you kind of know what's coming and you have that like dad strength and you also have like, the, the, you know, just the knowledge of like life and like movement. And <laughs> so like there's always like moments where they're just like, fuck, why? Like every time you get me, you know, like <laughs> it's just like I've been through a lot with yeah. the kids. That's sick. Oh yeah, Strider. Well, thanks for coming down, dude. Yeah, want to sight. hear some? Want to hear some stories? Yeah, we could get into quite a few. So many stories that Strider has. I know. I've heard a lot of them. You know who? Probably just, a fraction of them. Though. Do you know who just sent me the uh, photo? Who? Because uh, his, I think Walter was his, his uncle, or was it his dad? Marty Hoffman. Oh no way! You know Marty Hoffman? No, I know the name. Yeah, so. Flippy Hop or uh, Flippy and Flippy and uh, Walter. Walter just passed away. Yeah, so uh, he was like a you know. OG. Anyway, Marty and I, when I was like seventeen, this is a shark that tried to eat me. No that, way. That's Marty on the far right. What? And then Peter McGonagall and Terrence McNulty are the two other guys. Crazy. The guy with the blue deep like. Deepwater spear gun right there. Yeah. He, that guy saved my life. Gnarly. Where is that? That's in Cabo. Really? Off the, you know, like kind of when you're going out to the East Cape. Yeah. Um, 
there's like uh they had um the McGonagall's had I, I t- actually I think it was either Walter or Flippy's Palapa and it was up on the hillside and basically it's just like we surfed all morning it's like by Zacatitos yeah yeah, yeah like that whole zone yeah it's just just before all that and he's all he's they all we all went and surfed and I was a super grom. I was living in San Clemente at uh at Marty's house I just moved out of Christian Fletcher's house which was another story <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know you lived with Christian Fletcher. I lived with Christian Fletcher. It was, yeah. Crazy. But that's a different story. So I was down in Cabo and I'm like, we surfed all morning and they're like, yeah, we're going to go, we're going to go spear fishing. And I'm like, well, rad, I want to go. They're like, well, we don't have a spear gun for you. And I'm like, well, what am I going to do? And they're like, I don't know, like just hang on the beach. I'm like, dude, it's a hundred degrees. I'm like, it's like, what do I mean? Drink beer by myself. And like, they're like, no, no, no. Just like, I don't know, like, you can come with us, but here, you t- take this gaff. This will be your, like, whatever, your protection. protection. And I'm like, it's okay. You know, I didn't care. I was like, anyway, so we get into this little tiny boat. It's like a 10-foot skiff. And we start powering out. And like an hour later, dude, we're still going out. And I'm like, where are we going? And the guy's like, we're going to the Gordo Bank. Oh, I'm on the Gordo Bank. Like, what's that? And he's like, well, basically, it's like Jacques Cousteau's playground. And I'm like, all right, cool. You know, like, I was just oblivious to everything that was going on because I was a Grom. I was like, I had just turned 18, I think. And we were on our way out and we we're like almost there. And I'm like in this little weird little boat with the fumes of the little 25 horsepower engine like i'm like starting to get like feel sick to my stomach like green and they're like okay i think we're almost here and he's like looking at these two like mountain caps like, lining up these mountain caps and i'm like what it was we were like five miles out in this little tiny boat the four of us and the guy's like i think we're there peter, peter mcdonald's like lining up he's like and, and i'm like where what are you looking at and he's like see those two peaks See how they're just about almost aligned? And he's like, I'm like, yeah. He's like, okay. Once those line up, we're there. And I'm like, okay, perfect. And we get there. And he's like, yeah, this is it. We're chill. We got it. I think. We're, and and right then, I could see like water ruffling. Yeah. And I'm like, oh. He's like, yeah, that's the that's it. We're here. And I'm like, wow, crazy, okay. crazy, rad. I need to get off the boat. I'm gonna throw up. Like I, that's what I felt like. So I, I dive off the bo- the boat and I dive in the water. And I look and I think I see the bottom. And I'm like, whoa, it's really shallow. And I come up, I'm like, well, it's like, I can see the bottom. They're like, no, no, that's not the bottom. And I'm like, what? So I go back and I swim back down. I'm like, look, and it's like freaking probably a thousand tuna. No way. Swimming by, like crazy schools of fish. And then I see a, a, a there's another uh, hammerhead like group. And it was just like, I was like, oh my gosh, like this is okay. <laughs> this is next level. Like, full craziest thing i've ever seen and then so marty and peter and terrence jump off the boat with their spear guns and they all kind of like spread out and the last thing i remember was i don't know it was marty or peter and they're like just stay next to the anchor line you'll be fine and i'm like okay i got that cool and so i'm like swimming around like i'm probably in the water like maybe two minutes and I see what I think is like a big old tuna. And I'm like, whoa, there's a big fish. Got closer. I'm like, that's a really big fish. That's like a, a marlin. <laughs> and then it was like, oh, that's not, that, that's a fucking shark. <laughs> and I was like, and I was so scared. I remember like being so terrified that this shark was coming at me. And I was like, okay, well, I got this, hit it in the face, hit it in the face, like with my, in my mind, like thinking. And so the shit came right at me. It fully picked up on how scared I was. And it like came right, literally right to me, went right below me and did like two or three circles and then floated up at me. And I popped it in the face, no right in the way. nose. And the thing went like, kind of like looked down at me and like, was like, huh, what? Like pissed, like a pissed off dog. And I was like, oh fuck, I could tell it got pissed and I was like getting scared or, and I was like terrified. I was like, literally I was like, fuck, I'm going to get eaten right now. 
And the shark, like, went twitch style, like, underwater, like, three or four more times, like, pissed off circles, like a pissed off pit bull, really. And then it, then it, like, floated up, like, stopped and floated up. And what, it was, like, went into attack mode, they call it, where the, the tail, like, whipped up over its head. And then the freaking... The, the, the side fins, like dorsal fins or whatever, they, they turn flare it down, out. they flare, and then the, um, the the gills, like, and it all happens, like, in sequence, you know? Have you ever watched it? Have you ever uh-uh. seen it before they attack? No. So it goes, and then the freaking jaws, like, recede, like, the gums come out, like, and then the eyeballs roll back, and then the tail whips. <laughs> And right when it whipped, dude, I was like, oh, my God. And I went to hit it in the face again, and I missed. And I was like, from me to, like, the shark's mouth was, like, probably where that speaker is behind you. Yeah. And I, like, was, it, I was, like, it was, like, missing, and it was going into its mouth. And, like, I was about to lose my arm, and freaking literally right then, Peter McGonagall sees all of this happening. And shoots the shark <laughs> in the back. What was it? A tiger? Shark? It was a bull shark. Bull shark. And I was like, ah! and I watched the shark like twitch out, shot, looking at me, and then just poof, bolted down. And I was like, Marley. holy shit! And I looked over, and Peter was like looking at me, like fucking kid, you know. <laughs> and he's like looking at me, going, "What the?" Like, kind of almost shaking his head underwater. And I, he looks down at his gun. He's got this brand new killer. It was like a $3,000 like nuts blue water gun. At the time, he held the world record for tuna. Crazy. For spearfishing. Like 450 pounds. What? Anyway, he's like in the water with his gun. He doesn't have a float on it. And he's watching the spool smoke underwater. <laughs> he, it's just going... <laughs> And I'm watching it because he's watching it, and I'm like looking at him, going, well, "What the fuck are you? Get, what are you? Get, what are you doing?" And he just like looked at me and wrapped his arms and his legs around the fucking gun, just held and on, knew that it was coming to the end, and just went boom, down into the deep, oh. like so deep, over 100 feet. I couldn't see him. And oh I'm my like, God. "Oh my god, Peter's dead. He's fucking dead." So I come up, and I'm like looking around, and I hear uh, Marty and Terrence like. Where, where's Peter? I'm like, he's dead. He went down with a shark. I'm going to, I'm getting the boat. They're like, what shark? I'm like, I'm fucking, where's the boat? And I'm like looking for the thing. And I'm like swimming as fast as I can across the water. But this time I have drifted away from the boat, like probably 200 yards. Oh, I'm pretty crap. far from the boat because this whole thing, but because the currents and everything yeah. out there, right? There's a lot going on, but this all happened in like, Dude, literally like 45 seconds Yeah. at this point. And I'm like screaming murder and freaking Marty's like, what shark? What are you? And all of a sudden I'm swimming back to the boat. Probably like whatever. It's probably like 45 seconds later. I hear this. Hey. Hey. He's coming back up. I fucking look down and the fucking shark is coming right for me. Right for me again, jaws open, blood coming out of its gills with a freaking spear in its back, and it's right coming right for me, dude. Oh and I'm like, dude, are gosh. you kidding me? Are you? I'm like, Marty's like, fuck, okay, turns, goes down, boom, shoots the thing again, right? Pissed, wow, it's like fucking thrashing in the water, tweaking. It's got two spears in it. I'm like, ah! I literally walked on water. Got to the boat. Hydroplaning. You get on the boat. I'm like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Terrence gets on the boat. Marty's still in the water. Peter's still in the water. Marty's like, shoot the shark again. Shoot the shark again <laughs> to Terrence. Terrence shoots the shark. He's fucking, <laughs> the, the recoil from the gun like f- flies him back on the seat oh into the boat. And he's God. like, whoa. And so then this thing has three spears in it. And it's still thrashing in the water right next to the boat. Jeez. We all get on the boat. I'm like, I'm pale white. Dude, you could, I'm as white as that surfboard, dude. And I'm like, okay, okay. <laughs> what, what, what? All right. Marty's like, fuck, oh, you're right. You know, they're, all, these, they're just like these 
Peter and Marty are like these gnarly, gnarliest humans in the world to me at this point. Yeah. I'm like, fuck. And so they're like, okay, we'll tie it up. Let's put it on the boat. I mean, it wouldn't go on the boat because it was bigger than the boat. So we're like, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll drag it backwards. <laughs> we'll drag it in, right? So they tie up the tail and they go, why don't they pull the anchor? And they're like, Wang. barely moving. We're not going anywhere. <laughs> the shark is winning. The shark is swimming the other way. And we're like, fuck. And so Peter jumps full Tarzan, knife in his teeth, dives in, takes a fucking knife, stabs the thing in its stomach, opens it up, pulls the guts out, fucking totally guts it right there in the water, kills the shark, finally. We drag it all the way in, we fucking carry it up the freaking slope. I remember there was this gnarly bank. Get it up to the palapa, they tie it up. We take a picture for keepsake. That's crazy. And that's the photo. That's so nice that you just got sent. From Marty, who just sent me this. Because he was, like, we were reminiscing about uh, Tamayo Perry. And, uh, and then Walter, you know, his, the whole thing was just, like, just leaving life. And that's the freaking picture from the, the trip and it was just like it's so gnarly thinking about that that's so gnarly that's so gnarly crazy so when I, then I was like so anyway I've been scared of sharks like ever since like super scared of sharks I bet like, I've been like terrified of sharks and, and I've like seen them in the water and I've been like but I've always had this like fear thing and um, I recently went to the Maldives and I went surfing down there with um, a group and I kind of got over my fear of sharks. Did you swim with them? Yeah, I'm going to show you. We did that, but they were just nurse sharks where we went down oh, there. Really? Yeah. yeah. This is a pretty large tiger shark. Is that you? Yeah. Oh my gosh. That is so gnarly. I'd say you got over your fear. <laughs> it was so healing. Holy crap. So These sharks were so big. And Dude, it's, that thing's so big. It looks like a submarine. So they're, they're super well fed. And this guy, he's like super, like, we had this guy who was just like, he was the man. He wasn't, it wasn't through the four seasons, was it? No. Okay, because we met a guy down there who was so cool that he convinced us to go swim with these sharks. And I probably would have done something like that with him if. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was. Uh, I'm gonna pull up the uh, guy's name. That thing moves too, if you want to. Because uh, the guy was like, he was so rad. This guy was like, I don't know. He was. Um, there's a Not guy. an English dude, huh? No, he yeah. was this. He was uh, Lonu. Lonu at Lonu Break, and he he they're on this. Um, this different island in the chain and like it's known for just the shark dives and a lot, and they they feed the sharks basically because they tuna the tuna come in they bring the boats in and then they they basically give all the extras to the sharks so they know the names of all the sharks the sharks know him and Whoa. he like has like this like crazy business like he's like created a whole economy on this island or people who want to go dive with the sharks. Not really. And most lo most people go with tanks, you know, yeah. because they feel like more, I don't know, comfortable or whatever. But like we were just free diving and we were like with him and like diving with it. Like there was like five of them at one point. Dude, that's and they're crazy. like swarming around us oh and they were just gosh. like cruising in and out of us. And it was like we, it was, it was almost like they knew and we were there, and we knew that we were playing together. Mm -hmm. It was it was bizarre, but my fear was gone. My at first when I the first one I saw it came in super fast, and I got a little bit like oh shaky. And then yeah. after that, like I started getting more and more comfortable. And then before I knew it, we were just hanging with these sharks. Wow, that's it was, insane. It was sick. Did it make you feel less scared to go like to see sharks in the wild now? No, like. It, I'm I'm still scared of sharks. Yeah, <laughs> I mean everybody should be scared of sharks. If you're not like scared of sharks, you, you know they're they're not something to be feared. 
but they're they're definitely the apex predator yeah. in the water, and they're fuck you up. You know, they're gonna if they if they want to, and they make mistakes, and that's what happens. You know, and like you're like they're not they don't want to eat you, but if you if they feel threatened by you, or if you do something aggressive towards them. Or there's like a, a moment where you scare them and their like reaction time, I think would be to like bite you or whatever, you know, like, but if you're, if you come in contact with them at an eye level and you actually are mellow and they're mellow and they come up to you and just, you can like push them away or, you know, like they catch your vibe. It's pretty, they're, they they know what food they want really. Mm-hmm. You know, and you're not it. That's what I always think. I'm like, there must've been so many times where I've been surfing around home or J bear or something oh. where there's just. West Oz, a white shark, just like, boop, 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 hey, what up? Okay, I'm going to keep yeah. going. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, like, yeah. has to be tens or hundreds or maybe more times. Probably thousands. Yeah, it's kind of crazy to think about. They're pretty cool. I remember my first surf ever at J-Bay. We were, like, staying up at Boneyards. And I'm like, yeah, and I was, like, with all the, you know, our whole crew, our commentators crew, we had, like, with the killers – Jerky's dream, this, this building. Oh, yeah, yeah. I stayed and, there one time. And like, we're, I just like, I was like, okay, the waves weren't that good. But I was like, first surf, let's go surf. And like, they're like, yeah, we'll go down to the keyhole. And I'm like, well, there's a perfect channel right there. Like, why don't we just paddle out there? And they're like, well, I don't know. You know, and they can, and, and I was like, whatever, let's just paddle out. And I'm like, all right. So we paddle, go to paddle out. And I kind of got sucked kind of towards the reef a little bit. I was with Rosie Hodge and like, Todd Klein and somebody else. I can't remember who else was coming out. Maybe Joe Trapel, Slow Joe. It was like the last <laughs> one in the water. And like we're paddling out and we're kind of about to get caught inside by this wave. And Rosie's like looks over at me and I look at her and I look up and there's a freaking 15 footer in the face of the no wave. No way. Huge shark. What? And I'm like, oh. That's a fucking great way. <laughs> like, you know, in my mind. And then really? I'm like trying to be mellow and calm, you know? And the wave is like, whatever. It's like right there. It's that far away. It's where those glass doors are. And I'm like, that's a, that's a big, big fucking shark. That's not a dolphin. That's, that's a freaking huge shark. You can see by the way they're moving. And I'm like, all of a sudden, Rosie, like the thing looked like it was coming at me. All of a sudden, Rosie goes, shock in her freaking all, in her accent, you know? And oh I'm like, my gosh. don't do that. I looked over at her like, don't do that, yeah. <laughs> you know? And, she, the way, and the thing like kind of turned away from me and kind of looked like it was going for her. And then the wave like was breaking and I just, I just took the wave in the ass. Just like, boom! And then like, I come flying out of the white water. <laughs> Onto, I'm like going towards dry reef and I'm not going to stop. I'm going right onto the reef and I'm going towards the reef and I look over and I don't see Rosie. Oh God. And I'm just going, Oh my, did Rosie just get in? Oh my. <laughs> I was so freaked out. And then we like got to the reef. I literally ran up on the reef, you know, and like looked over and then Rosie, to find her. Rosie was like, another wave had come and she was like just groveling in. And then like we see Joe, we're like, Joe, Joe. I'll go out. <laughs> Come in. Because he was just starting to paddle out. Crazy. That was the year with Nick Fanning. Oh, that was? Yeah. That thing was hanging out. Yeah. I it got pulled just, out of two heats at J-Bay, like mid-heat, yeah. like do-do-do, and then you like look over and see the jet skis. I'm like, what's going on? Oh, <laughs> that's what's going on. Anyway. Up on the jet ski, and, I, and they kept being like, oh, I was like, well, where is it? Like, take me over. I want to see it. It's pretty wild. Let me see that thing. And then the first one, they were like, oh, it went down. But then the next time, I think I was in a heat against like Wade Carmichael, maybe. And then I could see it. I, it was in so shallow. It went through the back of a wave. And we were like out the back on the skis. And I could see it just cruising up the line. Because you know how they, one year when we, I was out there on the back of the ski. And they're like, the, the thing was like coming up. Up the point, right. And they're, they're like, here comes the shark. They're clearing the water. I was like, all right, cool. And I was sitting there. And all of a sudden, like. I'm like, how far away is it? And they're like, because they have the drone. Yeah. And it was Milby. Milby's all. Oh, it's basically right next to you. <laughs> and I'm all, what? And I looked over and the shark was like right there. And I went, oh, it's literally, I was on the sled. And I went, it's like, and it came right, like literally to the sled. Crazy. And I was like, went to pet the shark. <laughs> Like literally I went to like, just like, I was like, whoa, there's a, you know, I was going to pet the shark and Milby's all, 
don't touch the fucking shot. <laughs> I was like, fuck, he's in my ear, you know? Freaking yeah. Out. And I'm like, oh, dude, all right, fuck, you, whatever. Yeah, oh my God. <laughs> and it like spying on and you. And then the it drone. did like a circle around us and then kept going. So crazy. That was pretty crazy. I want to go to like the OG Strider. Like, how do we end up with Strider as we know Strider now? You're like the international man of mystery, <laughs> WSL, face of the commentating life and <laughs> shade, all this shit that you've done, but like, How'd you get here? That's a really long story. I know. <laughs> you grew up in Santa Monica though, right? I grew up in, yeah. Like Dogtown days. Yeah. What like, was that like? I was, I was born in Northern California. And then when I was like three months old, my dad got deported back to England. Oh, no way. Yeah. And my mom and my dad and I, or my dad got deported. So then my mom, my brother, and, and I we got on a plane to follow him back to London. And he got, he was, he was a drug dealer and he got busted. And so they made him go home. And so then we got back to England and when I, we lived there till I was like six or seven, six and a half, rolling around limousines, patent leather shoes, going to music studios, hanging out with the Rolling Stones. Really? Because my dad was the man. Crazy. Right? He, he supplied Everybody. No way. Then got busted. One last deal. And he went to jail. <clears throat> they gave him 10 years. And so my mom and me and my brother left again and went back to California. And that's how I started surfing. Because we, my mom ended up suing her way into a, we basically didn't have any money because was, everything was seized. So we ended up in a rent control building on the beach in Santa Monica that was, didn't allow kids. My mom's like, what? She found a loophole, won the, the suit. But she was like, very, I have my way or the highway. And like, so next thing I knew, we were living in this building called the Sea Castle Apartments on the beach in Santa Monica. I don't know, do you know where Shutters is? Like that hotel at the end of Pico? Yeah. Anyway, it's the next building up from that. Okay. And so like, <clears throat> but back in, back then it was just kind of a gnarly scene. Like it was, uh, it was a lot of drug dealers and like we would get like people walked. I remember we were in the parking lot and this guy walked up to us with a freaking AK-47 and was like, give me everything you got. And my mom's like, are you my food stamps? <laughs> and the guy, cause we had this cool old station wagon, this Impala station wagon that was really cool. And my mom said it got stolen, but I think maybe she sold it because we needed money. But, like, it was pretty nuts. Like, I saw a guy get shot on the boardwalk. And, like, there's just, like, but the thing about being there was we had, we had the beach. And we would run out there and just play all day. And uh, my mom would be partying and just hanging. And she was, you know... Pretty, pretty wild woman, pretty much, you know, in her own world and like just um, got us a place to live. People would lose their surfboards or their boogie boards because it was late 70s. And not everybody even had leashes yet. And so we would like wait for people to lose them, grab them, ride them in the shore break until they figured out we were on them. And yeah. then they'd be like, get the fuck off my board. You know? <laughs> and so that's how my brother and I started surfing. Sick. And then... I like literally remember I bought my first surfboard from a yard sale across the street from my elementary school, five bucks a week. I was like, that's what I was getting for allowance. And this guy's like 20 bucks, bro. It was an old Jeff Ho dome deck, single fin. Fuck, I'll never forget getting that board. My mom took me over to um, Jay Adams's house. No way. And I got a, a new Z flex foam fin for the, I remember it was yellow and white and it had foam in it. And, and, and fiberglass, and it was like the sickest, like, tech. Anyway, my mom and his mom used to party together. Okay. So then he, like, hooked me up with <clears throat> a fin and, like. Was, is Jay a little bit older than you, right? Jay's older, yeah. Yeah. He was, he was definitely older. He's, like, um, a lot older than me. Okay. But, um, so him and, like, Tony Alva 
and Jim Muir and Kevin Ansel and pretty much all these like older Dogtown guys, Skip Emblem, um, were like the like kind of the nucleus of it. And then there was all these other guys that I knew. And then there was guys that were a little older than me, like the McClure brothers, like John and Dan McClure and had Mike Packham and Randy Wright and all these like Craig Cottle, all these like pro surfer guys. And then Nathan Pratt was the guy who had the surf shop, uh, Horizons West. And so when I, when I started surfing, I started like doing the boogie board contest too with Keith Sasaki no way. and like drop me and like the whole thing. I'd be surfing on my boogie board and I'd win the boogie board contest and then I'd win this little surf contest. And I was like, started to get like boogie boards and like clothes and like I got sponsored by Horizons West and it was like right up the street. It was like where the old WSL office is. Okay. Right there, like where Dogtown Coffee is. Yeah. It was like right next door to that was where Horizons West was. And there was like, just like, I, that was every day. I'd hang out right there skate the little bank in front of Santa Monica Farms, which was the little health food store. I got a freaking two page spread in Thrasher magazine doing a big like laid out Larry Bertelman slide on that thing. No way. So how old were you like at that point? I was <clears throat> I was like when I got sponsored, I was like ten. Oh, you were young. Yeah. And then when I was twelve I won the nationals. Was it NSSA at that yeah, point? It was the NSSA Nationals. It was at Huntington beat Shane Beshin. I was all psyched. The only one that like got outside and like got a, I just remember like all psyched. That's so sick. And then from there, I kind of like, there was a lot that happened in between. <laughs> a lot. Like my brother was gnarly. He was like, he's sober now, but he was a gnarly crackhead. And like, it was like my mom was freaking out. And it was like growing up was, I was just on the streets and learning how to like survive kind of on my, on my, on my own with my buddies and my buddy's parents and like <clears throat> having to deal with like my brother and my mom and like, just like brutal, like mom hanging out of the window. Like it's all my fault type shit. And like having to go into like the hood and find my brother smoking crack and I... him just like smoking in a room with like, not like, I don't love you or mom. I just love this crack pipe. Crazy. Like answers, you're just like, I, was yeah. like, I grew up real fast. I was yeah. like, fuck. <laughs> and uh, basically surfing was my, my savior because I got to, I would always just be able to go surf. I was just like, fuck it. <laughs> and no matter what was going on behind me, I'd just be, look out, and everything was cool in the ocean. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And then from there, <clears throat> oddly, I was at, I'd be, during that same time, I was at Horizons West, and this lady came up to me, and she's like, I want to take pictures of you. And I was like, what? You weirdo. <laughs> anyway, it ended up being Herb Ritz's, you know, this, there's this guy named Herb Ritz, who's like, if you look him up, he is the most incredible photographer, fashion photographer in the world. And at that time, he was the number one fashion photographer in the world. Oh, and I was, next thing you knew, I was sitting there doing, like, I was doing photo shoots with uh, Olivia Newton-John, with uh, Cindy Crawford. What? Daryl Hannah on the cover of Tatler Magazine with her tits in my face when, like, that movie Splash came out. Like, all this, like, dude, the, like, the book I have when, I'm, when I was a kid at that age, from 12 to 13, it was just fucking crazy. Whoa. And I was making fucking mad money to 1500 bucks a day when you're like 12 years old. Yeah. Right? You're like, what the <laughs> fuck? You know, I'm on welfare. Literally, like, going to school with food stamps and food tickets and getting made fun of every day to, like, all of a sudden I had, like, a bunch of money in the bank. And crazy. I was like, oh, shit. And... My mom would tax me for some of it, but she gave me a credit card, like an ATM card. And I was like, oh, okay. Like, so I used that. And I, that's how I went to Hawaii, to the North Shore the first time. I went to the, I went to, the first time I went to Hawaii, I went to the West Side for the U.S. Championships. First at time just straight to the West Side. So I got, and I surfed for Town & Country at the time. I was, I was on Horizons West. Then I got on Town & Country. And then they sent me to Hawaii. And those guys picked me up. And Sonny Garcia and I went to the factory and I got three boards and he got two. 
Uh -oh. not stoked. <laughs> So my third board became one of his buddies' boards real quick. <laughs> and oh so I was gosh. like, on the, on the west side with Sonny, like surfing Miley Point, like hitchhiking to Makaha. Crazy. And I was like 13. What? And I was like, dude, it was crazy. I was staying at his house with his parents. I remember I like made the semis. I was all bummed because I didn't make the final. But... That was the first time I went to Hawaii, and then everybody was like, oh, what, you freaking never went to the North Shore? Like, what, you didn't go to Pipeline and all this? I was just like 13 years old, just like, fuck. And I had the money from doing the modeling stuff, and so I bought tickets for me and my two buddies. And we, this is pretty heavy that, like, we pulled this off, but I told my mom that Town & Country had us all set up in Hawaii. And we had nowhere to stay. <laughs> so me and my two buddies get on a plane. Did they even let you on a plane at this point when you're yeah, 13? Yeah. I, dude, <laughs> my, I think my mom might even have like took me to the airport or I can't, I mean, obviously we got there, but my two buddies were older at like 15 and we get there, get in a taxi cab. In town. Okay. You ready for this? Get dropped off. You know the Sunset Lifeguard Tower? Yeah. In the dirt right there? Dropped off in the dirt. The guy fucking... Whoo, give him a hundred bucks. The guy just fucking peels out on us and just dusts us. <laughs> right? So it's a cloud of fucking sandy smoke. Two board bags. Me and my buddies. My other... One of my buddies' boards didn't come. And I'm like... They're like, well, now what? I'm like, okay, we've got to walk over to Cammy's. And there's a board there with places to stay. And this is all hearsay. Like, no, like, <laughs> there's no, like, Google. There's no, like, cell phone. There's, there's, like, straight up. My buddy, Mike Packham, told me about this, like, board at Cammy's where the surf shop is. And there's places to stay. And there's, all you got to do is call the numbers and you'll you just get a place. No way. <laughs> so we drag our board bags back across the, the, the Sunset Bridge. To Cammy's, which is probably like 200, 300 yards. Yeah. Pretty far. Yeah. Three grommets with board bags. Walk over. I'm looking at the thing. I'm writing numbers. And I'm like, see, look, you guys. And they're like, oh, okay, yeah. Like everybody's starting to feel better because they were a little stressed. And boom, the surf shop door opens and out comes Davey Miller. And I'm like, Davey Miller. He's like, Did I know you? I'm like, no, I know you. Because at the time, he was the guy at in Hawaii. He was the number one Californian for charging Sunset and Pipeline. And back then, Sunset and Pipeline were life. And I was like, dude, you're the guy. And he's like, what are you, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm looking for a place to stay. He's like, you got any money? I'm like, yeah, I got money. He's like, let me see. He's like, so I pulled out cash. I'm like, here. He's all, put your shit in the car. No way. So we put our board bags in the car. He had this station wagon. Me and my buddies are like giddy at this point. We're like, oh my gosh, Davy Miller, we're getting a ride. Like, we're going to, we're, we have no idea where we're going. Zero idea. Get in the car, drive down the street, pull into a, a, a car port, right? I'm like, kind of sketchy feeling, like dark, you know? And I'm like, fuck, where are we? You know, like, get out of the car, walk into the house. He opens the room and he goes, okay, here, this is your room. Now, come here. Walk out onto the deck. He's like, see that wall? I'm like, yeah. He's like, that's off the wall. That's This wave is called off the wall because of this wall. No and way. And I'm all, what? And he's like, that's back door and that's pipeline. And that's all you're going to need to know for the next 20 years. Crazy. And I'm all, what? That's pipeline? That's back door pipeline? And that's off the wall? And like a hundred yard space. He's like, yeah, give me the money. <laughs> I'm like, fuck. So we gave him our, our rent money. Uh, we were there for like a week. That's insane. And that was my first trip to the North shore. Wow. It was pretty fucking crazy. <laughs> and like, but I remember this guy, Kevin, who was staying in the house who like, I think it was his house or he was renting it. Anyway, he was, they were both, doing drugs and you know whatever it was a lot going on and he one time he's like just paddle out right here and it was like almost right in front of his house like way too far down and i paddled out and like 
I like made it. There wasn't enough sets. So like I made it almost out to back door and got flogged by a huge set. Just wallops. Just wallops on the reef. Oh my God. Because like, I didn't know like I was supposed to go down and around. It was my first time ever paddling out off the wall or yeah. back door or anywhere. And I was just trying to go to pipeline. And he's like, yeah, just paddle straight out. But thinking that the current would take me down and around or I would know to take the current around. And I just got, but anyway, that fear and energy and vibe of like, I lived through it, like turned me on so hard that all I wanted to do was surf pipeline. That's so sick. So there was like a, a comedy of errors that really got me hooked on, to surf a wave like that. And then another comedy of errors got me on the cover of Surfer. I was, you posted that on Instagram recently, right? Yeah, the was, story was, about <laughs> Biola yeah. shaping you. The, like he's <laughs> oh, I'm trying to figure out how to shape these pipeline boards. Yeah, he... he so, but that was, that was like quite a while after, like how so old that, were you? That was when I was like 13, going on 14. I was just about to turn 14. You were, wait, you're that young in that cover shot? No. Oh. No, I was 22 in the cover okay. shot. Okay. So when I was like, I was just turning 14, going through the whole motion with like my first trip to the North Shore. And then after that, I had done multiple trips back there. Yeah. Um, and at what point did you start riding for quick? When I was 22, and um, I was 21, actually, I was I had, was surfing a bunch, like going to Hawaii, where I'd work restaurant jobs, basically. Um, I, after I graduated high school, I went, lived in San Clemente. I worked in the back of Astrodeck packing boxes, and the Mexicans would like, make lunch and I'd eat, I'd basically was in the back with the Mexicans packing boxes and eating freaking tacos and riding my bike back to uh, Christian's house and saving my money. But I was like, wanted to be in San Clemente and like the Mecca of surf. So you knew from like Santa Monica, you're like, that's where I got to be if I want to make it in surfing pretty yeah. much. So when I graduated high school, high school, I was like, I want to go down there. And so I did. And that's when I met Matt and those guys. And I was like, driving around in my 64 Dodge Dart push button, like just old school, just freaking slant six, bought it for 500 bucks and was just like meal to meal, really. And, but I knew that, <clears throat> I knew that San Clemente was where it was happening and then I knew I needed to get to Hawaii again. And I was always going back there working in restaurants. I was worked at the Chart House in Dana Point for a while. And then I worked in like Santa Monica at restaurants after I left San Clemente to go back up home. And I was like 20, 21. <clears throat> My mom was like, you know, fuck, you gotta think about maybe going to school or what's your, what's your, what are you, you going to do? And I was like, I'm going to go back to Hawaii. Just, I got to go back to Hawaii. I, 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 and I did this crazy sweat lodge, got invited to this sweat lodge, this um, Indian sweat lodge up in Malibu in the mountains. My buddy, Steve Segrist, invited me and a bunch of our friends we all went and like these like sun dancers were there and we I went through the whole thing and I had a full outer body experience like full blown like saw my soul like my body was dead on the dirt and it was the craziest thing ever. crazy like saw my my colors like purple and gold like just crazy and afterward the guys were like you should come to a vision quest. And I was like, bro, what? That's like way too much. <laughs> that wasn't a vision quest. <laughs> I was like, what was that? You know, <laughs> yeah. they're like, well, that was a cleansing ritual. And I was like, okay, well I just freaking died and like saw my soul. And now I'm like, vision quest sounds kind of gnarly. <laughs> and they're like, well, just you're on a perfect path. And I'm like, really? And the guy's like, yeah, I'm like, okay, awesome. <laughs> and I went down. So remember Ricky Massey? No. From Venice. So he was like my nemesis surfing. So Venice wasn't allowed. Nobody from Venice went to Santa Monica, and nobody from Santa Monica was dumb enough to go to Venice because you'd get beat up. They'd take your surfboard, break your fins out. Like, you know, Venice Breakwater was gnarly. Venice Jetty was gnarly. But 
he and I were surf partners in the contest. So we would surf against each other in the WSA District 4 events and anything that was going on. We had these homeboy contests from Horizons West. And he and I were best friends and each other's nemesis at surfing. And he is super, super great surfer, rode for Quicksilver. And <clears throat> when I got older, he's like, he's like, I'll get you a meeting with Robbie Todd. And I'm like, cool. So I went to Quicksilver when I was 21. And I had my book, and it was after the sweat lodge. And I had my, and my parents, my, my mom was kind of like stressing on me a little bit. And all my friends' parents were like, dude, you need to, like, you can't just work in a restaurant your whole life. Kind of like this weird, like, pressure thing. And I was like, fuck, I'm so happy. I surf every day. I work at night. I'm, fuck, everything's great, like, in my mind. And um, so I get this meeting to try and get some sponsors. I'm going back to Hawaii. And I go down to Quicksilver and Danny Kwok like looks at my book I'll never forget sitting in his office like you know here's the marketing director at Quicksilver the dream company to surf for and I'm like sitting there just nervous as fuck and he's like peeling through my fucking my portfolio remember how you had those books yeah yeah and I had all my photos in there and I was like <clears throat> I was like oh yeah that one from, yeah that was Pipeline yeah that, oh, yeah that one you know like all stoked and he kind of like shut the book and he like, looks at me and he goes you know what, Strider? I don't need another fucking Howley going to Hawaii trying to be a hero. Sorry, man. And I like literally fucking was like in tears. He like pushed my book back at me and said, good luck. Oh, wow. Uh. Basically kicked me out of his office. And I went out and Robbie Todd was out there. And I'm like, and he's like, oh, so what's up, man? I'm like, fuck, he basically told me he didn't want a fucking Howley going to Hawaii. And I'm like, what? He's like, oh, wait, 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 fuck, wait a minute. And he goes back and he comes back out and he gives me, he gave me like a box of fucking, yeah, I, got, I remember those, like a couple pairs of trunks, a short john, and some stickers. And he goes, and I think he gave me 500 bucks or something like that. It was something crazy. Like, and he's like, go to, he's like, go to Hawaii, do your thing. You got to make it happen. So I go to Hawaii. Gave you a chance. I fucking put the stickers on my board. And I had a 7-Eleven, an 8-2, and a 9-1 from Matt Biolas. No way. And they were all the biggest piles of shit ever. <laughs> but I thought they were the cat's meow. I was like, look at how sick these boards are. They're... And I brought them over. I remember walking into the pipe house, like all stoked. And make people looking at him going, whoa, fuck, you're going to ride this? <laughs> crazy <laughs> anyway i was sitting on the beach at pipeline and it was like midwinter at this point i was sleeping on the garage floor at alex cox's house peanut and it was like basically dude i had nothing and i was sitting on uh, i was like literally waiting for everybody to go to sleep every night because the the Garage was like where the congregation would happen. They'd all smoke joints and drink beers and, you know, whatever until it was time they all went to sleep. And then that was when I got to go to sleep. And I'd pull the couch out on the grease spot, literally from where the cars were parked, pull the coffee table to the side and go to sleep. And I remember <clears throat> sitting in the bushes at Pipeline and smoking a joint with somebody. And it was like 200 guys and what you would call it, I was like, fuck it's so crowded and I, I just wish I could remember who it was sitting next to me but he goes fuck just takes one man and he like handed me the joint and I was like light bulb I'm fucked yeah you're right I'm gonna go get one one like if I could get one fuck I'll be stoked so I rode my bike back to Peanut's house I got my my short john on and I fucking rode back down there I put my bike in the bushes and paddled out I remember paddling out and I was just like just packed and with the gnarliest crew you could possibly think of like the gnarliest of gnarliest Hawaiians everywhere like it was just wall to wall and I was like fuck that looks like impossible to catch a wave so I says I kept paddling and I got out to like in between first and second reef and I saw Noah Johnson and Noah's all yeah Strider what's up man I'm like 
I think Noah like won Eddie like the year before or something. He was just like the fucking man. And I was like, I saw him and he's like, yeah, there's a wave that kind of pops up right here in between. And it's pretty good. Like there's, there's, there's too many people everywhere else. And I was looking out at Second Reef and I was like packed. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to keep paddling out there. And so I was like paddling out and all of a sudden this wave comes. And I'm like, oh my God, this is a fucking sick wave. And I look and Noah's like 40 yards too far in. And I'm like, are you going? And he's like, fuck you, go. You know, like, because no he went. And I was like, oh, oh. And I literally like my only wave. I caught that day, paddled into this wave, and I got to, the wave was so fucking nuts. It just stood up on the first reef, and I got to the bottom, and I remember coming off the bottom like so scared. I was like, oh, and I came off the bottom. I was looking up at it, and I'm like, oh, my God. And right as I came off the bottom, I had so much tail rocker in the board that I went, oh, and I almost fell off the back of my board. No way. Into this soul arch. And Don King was right there and took a photo. And I was like, whoa, like regathered myself, made the wave. Like, I think I sat out there for another like two hours, never caught another wave. And went back to the house, blah, blah, blah. This was like in December, probably. Maybe late November. Comes January, I'm still there. You know, it's like you, I went for the whole winter. There was no like half stepping. I was there for five months. That was like, and I remember I was up at like the sugar bar in uh, Kahuku. There was this bar up there. No oh, way. Uh. And Jeremy Biles comes running out, this Australian surfer. He's like, mate. He's like wasted. He's all, mate, mate, it's you and me. I'm like, what? Like, he's like, I got the center spread. You got the cover, mate. Oh, and I'm man. like, what? Like, like, whatever. He's wasted. And I went into this bar and next thing, it was like three chicks on me. And I was like, maybe I did get to cover. <laughs> 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 and then I was like, whatever. Long story longer. I went home. I couldn't find the fucking magazine. I went to the surf shop, sold out everywhere I went. Couldn't find it. Like, never saw the cover for, like, a month and a half went by since Crazy. it was out. And I was like, fuck, where's this fucking magazine at? And I remember going back to the, the house, getting, like, everybody go to sleep. And I remember, like, cleaning the coffee table. And on the coffee table was a magazine. And the magazine was face down. I remember those old Rip Curl search ads on the backs? Mm-hmm. And I was like, fuck, I haven't seen that one yet. And all the corners of the magazine were all ripped off to be used for crutches, car crutches and carburetors <laughs> for like yeah. the joints, you know? And like, I was like, oh, whoa. And like, I flipped over the magazine and I was like, there it was. Crazy. And I had a fucking fart coming out of my ass. <laughs> Howley kook drawn and arrow towards me, a joint in my mouth. And like, I'll never forget, like, just like, sitting there crying like best moment like my dream that's you know? so sick and then that night or maybe the next night i remember like getting all my shit together to go to bed and then all of a sudden the fucking door opens up and the light comes on and i'm like what the fuck like these guys won't just let me sleep because I was like the little Howley kid, right? And all these guys that were staying at the house were all from like Hawaii and like blah, blah, blah. And I was like, fuck, whatever. I just got to deal with it. And uh, I'm like, fuck, turn out the light, man. And like, I like look up and <laughs> where I was staying upstairs was this super hot chick named Tiffany who was staying up there. And I was like, looked up and she was like, doing laundry, but not doing laundry. And she like jumped in bed with me. No way. And I was like, Whoa, don't you have a boyfriend? And she's like, ah, yeah. And she gets up and leaves. I'm like, what am I doing? You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> Next night, same exact thing happens. She's like, I broke up with my boyfriend. 
Sure she did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what they all say. Anyway. Long, long. That was... Uh, Is that the one that got you sent you home? No. Okay. But I went home. I went home after that to Quicksilver. And Robbie Todd was all psyched, you know. And uh, Danny Clark. I knew you could do it. Oh, yeah. I'm like, you fucker. <laughs> <laughs> like, fuck, shut up, dude. Like, anyway, so I, and then, fuck, that was between surfing and working. I was like 20 years with Quicksilver. Crazy. A long run. That's so sick. And Quicksilver was my, was my college. It was my introduction to, to sales, to marketing, to corporate world, to like, backstabbing fucking bastards like just people saying yo yeah I'll do this that and this and not they never did it and unless it was on paper even if it was on paper they'd find a way like it was just so much bullshit that went on like I remember <clears throat> because I was I mean I'm a the way my life was I was never the best surfer but I hustled I'd buy a fucking Art Brewer or a fucking sandwich and Tom Survey. I'd go to fucking Cammy's and buy them fucking whatever they wanted and come back and I'd surf all fucking day and I'd get shots. Sick. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I was hustling. Make it happen. Yeah. So my job was to get a spread in one of the three magazines every month, which was Surfer, Surfing, or Transworld, right? That was my job. And all the other little magazines around, if I got scored shots or something internationally like it was rad but i just straight up would hustle and freaking when i when i got to the end of my hustle road with surfing which was like pretty quickly into it because i was realizing there's only so many magazines there's only so much growth you can have i was like we need to grow i need to grow this is how we're gonna do it i called up ray gun Details, Spin Magazine, Rolling Stone, and a couple other magazines. And I got the ad buys. And I said, all right. I brought the whole thing to Danny Clock at Quicksilver. I said, we need to advertise in these magazines. And I'm going to be in the ads. And he was like, we can't do that. I'm like, why not? He's like, fuck, that's like a million and a half dollars in, in advertising spend. And I'm like, what are you going to do? Advertise in the same fucking magazines over and over again? Where, how are you going to grow? Like, where are you, where, like, and I was hustling to, for my own sake to become a bigger figure, you know, personally. And he's like, yeah, yeah, we can't do that. And then, like, I think it was probably six months later, every single fucking magazine we, he had pulled ads in. Everyone. And I'm like, what? So you told me you can't do this. He's like, well, actually, it's the natural evolution for us. And I'm like, well, what about me? He's like, don't worry, I'll take care of you. I'm going to get you a fucking board riders club. I'm going to hook you up. And I'm like, okay, cool. Let's do it. Let me know. Like, what? Like, fuck. And I saw <laughs> Timmy Curran. I was like, wow, this guy's on the team? Danny Clock's like, yeah, this guy's on the team. I'm like, well, how did you, I thought there wasn't like any room on the team. And they're like, oh, well, we, we let Bruce go to uh, Balcom. I'm all, you did what? You fucking can't let Bruce Irons go to anywhere. He's the fucking man. <laughs> yeah. and, and he's like, no, 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 it's all, like we can get him back whenever we want. I go, no, we can't. And he goes, no, just, do you like serving for Quicksilver? And I was like, yeah. He's like, then shut the fuck up. And I was like, oh, okay. And sure enough, like, he had invested into Volcom and took all the money. His, it was all in his wife's name yeah. and pushed it over there. And the next thing you know, Volcom, you know, what happened there? Just, anyway, I watched the whole thing, dude. I learned so much at Quicksilver. So crazy, huh? It was crazy. It was crazy, dude. And I, and, and. I loved every bit of it yeah. because it literally taught me everything about business, about people, people, about how ruthless it is when you, when you're dealing with money, when you're dealing with millions of dollars, you know, like 
pretty heavy. And for me, it was, you know, it was school, it was my college. And I wouldn't have traded, I wouldn't trade it for the world because now my life is like, it's pretty fucking good. <laughs> it's amazing, actually. Yeah. And like, that whole, that whole world was pretty nuts. Working there was nuts. I thought that was the success story. Big corner office, fucking running the surf marketing department, you know, doing just ugh, 30 pounds overweight, doing drugs, fucking going like into the building. Like, oh, I mean, I was still surfing a lot. I was still doing like, I was still me as a surfer, but not the way I could have been because I got hurt surfing Chopu. I hurt my shoulder really bad. I had to get surgery. And so I started coming up with like all these problems. And Bob McKnight's like, just solve the problem. I don't want to hear about the problem. How do we solve it? And so I started fixing everything. I got us our house on the beach at Pipeline. I turned our, our whole scene, you know, because Quicksilver kind of had a funny era. And we, I kind of brought it back to the roots a little bit more. I had a bunch of fun and like, I don't know, there's a whole nother like paradigm shift like world of that. Like that's a whole nother crazy story me working there. Oh, I bet. Fuck. I can only imagine because I was in like the heyday of the industry. It was so crazy. That was when Quick and Billabong were like billion dollar companies. Yeah. I like. Helicopters and in these <clears throat> boat trips and Dude. houses on the beach. And I freaking signed Dane Reynolds contract on the back of my truck. No way. Yeah, nobody knows. Crazy. But like, he snaked me at the base. I'm like, come here. And he's oh, what, bro? I'm like, are you stoked at Rip Pro? He's all, I mean, uh, whatever. And then so I like totally got the fucking guys at Quicksilver. I think Todd Klein or somebody was supposed to deal with it, never did. So then I took back over and like went up, met his mom, did all this fucking shit. And he, Got him on the Young Guns trip, that trip to Indonesia, and signed his contract on the back of my truck at, on Canaan and, P, and the 101 yeah. at the Chevron station. Sick. That's <laughs> so crazy. And yeah, sent him off. And I fucking also took Kelly Slater on his only East Coast tour he's ever done. <laughs> That seems weird. Isn't that? It's only done one? One. Crazy. And he, he, he was so reluctant to do it. And I was like, dude, these are your people. You're from the East Coast. And he's like, yeah, I just don't have time and all this stuff. And I was like, we had this movie that we made about him. And <clears throat> I was like, we're going to pick the seven best stops in seven days. And we're going to go to the East Coast. He's like, how are we going to do that? I'm like, we're going to take the jet. He's all, what? I'm like, yeah, we're going to take the jet. He's like, if you can get the jet, I'll do it. I'm like, all right. So I went back to Quicksilver. I go, Bernard, Bob, I need the jet. I got seven days. You pick the towns. I'm going to hit them with Kelly. They're like, what? Kelly's going to do East Coast tour? I'm like, there's no fucking way. I said, yes, he is. You get me that fucking plane, we're going to fucking knock out the entire eastern seaboard. And they're like, okay. And Andy Ryan, I don't know if you remember him. No. Production manual, fucking hit all the spots, like where we were going to go. And we, we finished in Puerto Rico. And we fucking first stop, get to the venue. I can't remember where we were. It was obviously in the northeast. And the guys all, all right, well, you take the door, I'll take the bar. I'm like, what? What? Okay. Like, didn't even know what it meant. Thousands of people showed up. Surf movie, chicks, booze, fucking, the whole thing was just out of control. First stop. End of the night, the guy's like, oh, best night ever. The guy probably made 100 fucking 50 grand at the bar. <laughs> Hands me fucking five grand cash from the door. Classic. I'm all, oh, that's the door. Okay, cool. Yeah. And then wake up the next morning, go to the FBO, get on the fucking plane, fly to the next stop. 
No. All right, yeah, you, I'll take the door, you take the bar. <laughs> Next thing you know, I had fucking just wads of cash. And I'm flying on this private jet. And I got Slater. And we're just, I had to rotate the crew on the jet because there was only so many seats. And then Mo Daddy would drive the bus and everybody else would be on the bus to each stop. And then finally, <clears throat> we all flew to Puerto Rico and it was just a banger. Oh, I bet. Dude, it was just so mental. And we finished and Slater's like, how am I going to get to fucking Mexico? I'm all, what? He's all, I got a, a search event. In Barra de la Cruz. Oh, remember? no way. This was during that time. Do you remember that event? Yeah, yeah, of course. So. How could you forget that event? Are you ready for this? Yo. So the corporate's like, fuck, that was the most insane tour we've ever had. Thank you so much. I'm like, well, Kelly needs to figure out how to get to fucking Mexico because he's going to miss his heat. <laughs> They're like. Oh, take the jet. No way. <laughs> so Kelly and I, on the private jet, surfboards, him and I, <laughs> bank around, coming in, fucking waves. Like, we're just like, remember how pumping it was? Yeah. Get to the airport. This is the reason, I believe, why Andy won that contest. Get off the plane, walk out, Corey Lopez, Andy Irons, and he's like, what's up, yeah, fucking movie? Oh, what's up with your boy over there? Like, you know, about Kelly. Yeah. And he's like, well, the flight's here? I'm like, uh, well, our flight is here. He's like, what? What do you mean? What? Wait, you guys just flew in on that private plane? And I was like, yeah, we just finished this crazy tour on the East Coast, and they were so stoked they flew us down here on the plane. And he goes, where's my fucking plane? And he just pissed. What? You, what? Fuck you. Fuck you and your boy. I'm gonna fuck both of you guys. Fuck you guys. Where's Billabong? Where's my fucking plane at? Why the fuck am I, why am I sitting at the fucking airport waiting for my fucking girlfriend to come in here and you guys are fucking getting off a private jet? Just losing it. No way. Losing it. And Corey's like, Andy, like, fuck, chill, dude. And he's like making a scene. And he's like, I fucking hate you, but I love you. Fuck it. You know, he's like yelling. Yeah. And like, Kelly's like, just deflecting, getting the car, like, <laughs> you know, and he was so pissed and he won the contest. Oh, for sure. It was sick. That's so sick. Oh, I had to deal with so much fucking, I remember in France one year and he's like looking at me, he's like, fuck, where's your boy at? <laughs> I just fucking want my heat. Don't fucking pop the champagne yet. Not fucking yet, bruh. Fuck it. I see the champagne. I know you got it in the car. Oh, but Not my yet. Gosh. I'm fucking not done yet. But fuck, he's probably going to win. But not yet. Like, oh, fuck. Dude, I just fucking love Andy. That's so... Because you guys were like... You were friends with Andy and Bruce, but then you were... Yeah, we were like... Friends we were with really Kelly, like friends, taking care of like, him at Quicksilver. Yeah. And like... Yeah, there was... <sighs> endless crossroads. Yeah. Endless. Fuck. I feel like that's my first Strider introduction was like watching football schmutball. The interviews, <laughs> the interview section. Strider, Fuck. how's your winner, y'all? I got sent home once <laughs> or whatever you said. <laughs> that's the sickest film though. Oh my God. It's so good. Welcome house days. That's another thing nobody knows. I got them their house at Pipeline. Volca. No way. We were on this Quicksilver Hello boarding trip in Canada and Clint Moncada was there. I know Clint. And Clint's all, what's up, Strider? What's going on? What have you been doing? I'm like, you know what, Clint? I got something for you. He's like, what, what, what? I'm out. Here, call this number, buy this house. He's like, what? I'm like, this house is for sale right next door to my house. And this was before it was the Quicksilver house. I was renting that house. The quick, the quick where, house. Where the quick house was at yeah. Pipe. Right next door was this house and they were selling it. Didn't the Weatherly's own it? They owned it and this other guy bought it. Okay. And then it was for sale and then I was like, let's buy it. I told Quicksilver. They were like, no, we don't buy houses. I'm like, yeah, fucking idiots. 
<laughs> like, you know, well, you think pipeline's going somewhere? Like, fucking, I'm like, dude, you're it's just going to appreciate. We need a fucking place to stay every year. Like, why don't you just buy the fucking house? Because we make clothes. I'm like, fucking idiots. Yeah. Anyway. And said he spent Clint how much money are you running on? But they saw it as a write-off, and they needed the write-off. Yeah. Like, they didn't, it was just all. Short-term. Short-term fucking spreadsheets, fucking idiots. Anyway, beyond that. Clint Moncada's like, oh, really? Fuck, okay. Calls him up. Talks, they bought the house. So the, Vul- the original Vulcan house, I get them their house. I think silver platter. I'm doing them a, a favor. Biggest nightmare of my life. <laughs> Every night, fucking raging party next door. Right next door. At first I was like, yeah, yeah. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh my God. This is the biggest nightmare ever. Every night, just ragers. Chicks everywhere, fucking bumper stickers. I left my panties at the Volcom house. Just, <laughs> dude, it was so out of control. It was just like nuts. It would, it would spill over into our house a lot. And so we had like this fringe, like mini party happening, and there'd be girls and like whatever. It was cool, but ugh, it was gnarly. A lot of years of a lot of parties. A lot of everything. And pipeline. Yeah. I mean, it was the ultimate surf all day, party all night. That's what we did. So sick. I mean, fuck. So if you ask about how we got to Strider now, <laughs> that's about one tenth of it. If that, it's probably less. Less, way less. Because each one of those huge chunks of story has a bunch of stories in it. I remember. I remember. Braden Diaz. Remember Braden Diaz, David Dixon? Mm-hmm. Remember Dicko? I never really knew Dicko. I knew Braden. Obviously, you know Sean, uh, <clears throat> Tom Carroll and Ross Clark Jones. Yeah. So I start surfing for Quicksilver. I get the cover shot. They throw me a bone. I want to go on the crossing, which is this boat in Indonesia, the Indies Trader. 26 days on the boat. Like, we named Burger World. We named a bunch of fucking waves. We surfed perfect waves. We fucking, it was insane. Taj Burroughs was on the trip. Two weeks into the trip, Dicko looks over at me and he goes, fuck, are you scared? I go, scared? He's like, yeah. Like, Braden, like, they had obviously been talking about this before I entered the conversation. And Braden goes, yeah, fuck. I'm not scared of anything, but I'd be fucking terrified. And I go, I go, I go what the fuck are you guys talking about? And they're like, what? Why does Marvin Foster want to kill you? Oh. Oh, and I'm like, no. what? It, what? And they're like, yeah, bro, fuck the whole North Shore knows. I'm like, why am I just finding out now? And I'm on a boat in the middle of nowhere. Nothing you can do about it. In 1995. And I get on the sat phone. I'm like, Marty, give me the fuck. I need the sat phone fired up right now. I don't care how much it costs. I need to call. I pick up the phone. I call Marvin Foster. Marvin. Hey, Marvin. Strider. Like, I heard you were. Holy fucking hell. You're going home to your mom in a box. Click. Oh no. I'm like, oh my God, you guys aren't fucking around. Like, I was so, my stomach was turning. I was fucked up. I was like, well, what do I do? So I get next day, call again. Bruh, I told you. Click. I'm like, fuck. So at this point, my whole life has been go to Hawaii, surf pipeline. Live your dream. This is your this is your your ticket to being a pro surfer, right? I'm living the dream. I'm on a boat in Indonesia, and I'm in the middle of the biggest nightmare I've ever had in my whole life. I get off the boat. By the way, the beginning of that trip, I missed my flight. I thought it was two in in the afternoon. The flight left at two in the morning. Oh, I've done that. <laughs> I got a got a pedang or a. Um, a Jakarta nightmare uh, 
a taxi four and a half hours driving around in circles oh, no. with this crazy taxi driver. Anyway, walk, you finally get to the hotel. Don King opens the door butt naked. Hey, what's happening? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god anyway I get off the boat dream trip killer trip killer magazine article the whole thing I call again fuck bro You're, you fucking better not show up here I'm gonna kill you so then I'm at a crossroads like do I go to Hawaii and face the music literally could get killed because at this time Marvin Foster was the number one most wanted man in Hawaii. Not really. Number one. He was riding around on a bullet bike with a fucking shotgun on his back. And cops weren't even pulling, pulling him over. He was the scariest human you've ever seen. Ever. I, I was like, I was terrified. Or do, or do I just not go back to Hawaii and get a job and just quit surfing? As a, like, I finally get sponsored. Finally a Quicksilver. And I'm like, now all of a sudden I have to like make a decision. And I was like, fuck. So I went to Hawaii. I was staying at JD's house, my buddy JD. And he knows about it. And he's letting me stay at his house, which was a risk for him. Like took care of me, let me stay there. And next door was the Billy Goat house with like, those guys like Casey Curtis, Bill Ballard. And Bill Ballard, and all that whole crew who made all those movies. And there was always 20 people over there and five to 10 people over at JD's house. And the waves got good at Pipe and Rockies, and I surfed. I called, kept calling Marvin, no answer, no answer, you know, like, and then uh, phone rang at JD's house, and it was him. He's like, what you fucking fucking think you could just show up over here? Fucking surf pipeline and fucking Rocky Point. Fucking what you think it's all good? Click. And I'm like, oh my God. Fuck. Later that night, fucking in the house, plate full of fucking chicken, every night barbecue, you know, in Hawaii. Out front. I'm like, fuck. Hey, you know, JD looks at me, he's like, fuck. All of a sudden, on the side of the house, fucking, you know, a single wall, like little bump. Yeah, just was, like the whole house is rattling. It's just like, JD just goes, I think that's for you. And he looked out and he saw Marvin and Marvin's pacing back and forth. And he goes, Is Schreiter And JD's like, Yeah. And he looked at me and went, Yeah, it's for you. Oh, no. I walked outside. I went, Marv, I'm so sorry. I don't know what happened. I don't know why you're so upset, but like, can I, can I make it better? Can I do anything? Like, I walked down, there's like three little stairs, and I got to the bottom of the stairs, and I looked up, and I just started taking punches. Just, pull, 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 pull. Like, oh, fuck. Like, just, and I put my hands up, to st- and I was blocking punches. And he's like, oh, you want to fight? And I was like, fuck. And I just was getting, I was just getting pummeled, you know? And I was like, all of a sudden, the house next door went completely silent. This house I was in was completely silent. And I was getting beat backwards into the dark bushes behind the house. And at one point, he picked me up by my fucking throat with one hand. And he was like, so high. And he just shook me, and tossed me into the house, and then came over and started stomping on me. Oh my gosh. And fucking, I think it was Wonton Taloa showed up. Oh, Uncle Marv. And he's like, oh, what's up, Wonton? And right then I was like, oh, this is my chance. I fucking ran into the darkness of the bushes in the back where Tom Nellis has a house behind there. And it was so dark, you couldn't see. I dove into the bushes. <laughs> At this point, I had already had, my neck was all fucked up. I had broken ribs and two black eyes. Like, I was fucked up. But I was running for my life at that point. I literally thought he was going to kill me. Gnarly. And I was fucking, Marvin, like, I remember, I seen him, like, look around in the bushes. 
where is he fucking on this fucking strike door? And then he left. And I remember going back into the house. And uh, Billy Goat House was like still dead silent. Could have heard a pin drop. And all I saw was eyeballs looking out at the louvers, you know. I was fucking looked over like, fuck. I walked into the house. And JD, he handed me two of those like, you know those Minute Maid orange juice things? Those frozen ones? Mm-hmm. He just handed me two of those. And I just fucking put them on my eyes. And I remember just sitting there like, Wondering what was next. Yeah. Like, what does that mean? Like, is he coming back? <laughs> like, I had no idea what was going to happen. And I think it was a day later, the whole North Shore had heard about it. And it was like 20 people over in the middle of the street on the Cakey Road. And like, back then the bushes were super thick, so you couldn't see the main road. So it was pretty discreet. You know, we were just standing there and I was telling him kind of a story about it. And all of a sudden, fucking, fucking car comes around the corner, fucking fishtails right at the fucking crowd of people. People are diving into the fucking bushes, running into the house. It's fucking Marvin. He's back. And the only one that stood with me was JD. No way. And I'm like, fuck. And like, he gets out of the car, he comes running over. Oh, bro, what happened to you? And JD goes, you came over the other night? And he's like, oh, bro, fuck, I'm so sorry. I was the fucking, I was the party so hard, fucking, I was partying, was the drugs, and, and bro, I love you. I told everybody I was going to do it, so I had to do it. <laughs> no way. And he's like, bro, get your board. And the waves were like pumping and Waimea was breaking. He's like, bro, get your board. Let's go. We go surf Waimea. And I'm like, I can't surf, bro. And he's like, okay, okay. And John, and <laughs> like he left. And I couldn't, I mean, I was a couple, three weeks recovery. <laughs> Crazy. You still have no idea why. Oh, I know exactly why. Oh, you know why. My buddy Danny Kwok. No way. So I left. That that winter before, there I stayed at a house at V Land with his ex, baby, his the baby mama, this and a couple of other two girls, and I'm like fuck it, I'm in the ghetto, but it's dope. I'm on the beach, you know, close. I walk to go surf and blah blah blah, and um, ended up with. Um, you know, Marv would come by and he'd be fighting with his ex wife or ex girlfriend and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so the deal was just stay there. They send the bill to Danny. Danny would pay for the bills. They got into a fight that summer and basically said, I need the money. <clears throat> and if I, Strider would have paid the bill, I would have, I wouldn't need the money. Oh. And Danny Clock never paid the bill. And it was Danny's fault. Oh, man. But he blamed it on me because he had already been beaten up. And he told me about six months ago. Six months ago. Like six months ago now? Six months ago. In Santa Barbara at Rob Colby's place for Colby Plus, you know, the wetsuit stuff he's doing? Uh Uh-uh. He does does like direct-to-consumer Yamamoto rubber Okay. called Colby Plus. And I went and he called me and asked me to do him a favor so I could come and do like photos and Danny was there. And he, we all like hung out and blah, blah, blah. And I was like leaving and he came running out to the car and he goes, I'm so sorry. No way. And I'm like, for what? And he's like, for, you know, we're getting you beat up. I just didn't want to get beat up again. And he kind of like broke open the, the why, what happened. And I was like, what about the fuck? In my mind, I'm thinking, well, what about the the board riders club I was supposed to get? And what about the fucking... You broke up in the wind. You know, what about the um, all the like advertising and all this million dollars that you got and the, me keeping my mouth shut? Like, 
you know, just to keep my sponsorship days, like in my mind, it was just all racing back through like all this crazy shit. And I just was, I just accepted the apology and told him thank you. Wow. So you didn't know until six months ago? I knew, but I didn't know why. Okay. I knew that he didn't pay the bill and that's why I got beat up. I didn't know why it got blamed on me. Uh, really? That's a crazy story. <laughs> well, at least Marvin was probably your, kind of your boy after that. Yeah, I mean, we were, we, were, we were good, and then there was some other shit that happened, actually. Yeah. Got scary again. Oh, man. Isn't it crazy, like, just all the... I mean, everything always changes, but just the surf world, like Hawaii, Hawaii, the North Shore stories, like the surf industry, like pretty gnarly, it's so crazy. Because I'm when we were kids, like I mean, I'm 31 now. Yeah. So I feel like we grew up hearing all those stories and like going over the North Shore for the first time, just being like, "Oh my god, like yeah. this place <laughs> is so gnarly," and we were on like the tail end of that. Just like when when we started getting over to the North Shore and surfing, it was like, yeah, you know, you'd still get snapped on. It was still kind of gnarly. Like the parties were still going on, but it was like you still you could still even today, but it's super mellow compared to what it was. Yeah, it was. Yeah. <sighs> it's very kid friendly and family friendly now. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot, Didn't feel it's a lot that different way. now. Didn't feel that way when we first started going over there. Yeah. And just the whole surf and just like, I don't know. I just feel like when you're like 13, 14, just going on surf trips, like that's what my parents were just like, okay, <laughs> hopefully we're not making a huge mistake, but here you go. And we survived, but you know, I feel like now most kids go on trips with their parents and it's probably maybe for the better, I don't Every, know, maybe every, not. Everything changes. Yeah. And just the temperature of like, uh, the environment and what is like, you know, when I grew up, it was just abuse. Like literally, like you would get fucking abused all day, every day, and <laughs> verbally, physically, just fucking. You were a grommet. Yeah. You got nothing. You got no waves. If you weren't literally growing up in Santa Monica, if, if you weren't like witty and fast verbally. And you couldn't defend yourself. You would just be squashed up and put in a hole and gone. You know what I mean? Which kind of got, in a sense, I guess, got me ready for a job at the WSL. Yeah. Because I'm pretty witty. I can find things to say and create new, like, verbal and vernacular out of, like, situations that, like, my, the whole, my goal is to connect the viewer with the environment without saying the same thing over and over again. Mm -hmm. So bring them into being in the water as a part of a heat and give them emotion from the athletes and, and the environment, right? Like give them everything that they can. And, and, and basically to create this moment of joy, there's a lot of drama. There can be some, you know, all, all these different things. There's, there's, you know, triumph and, there's failure there's like everything is in there but it's pretty like it's pretty rad yeah no i think you do such a good job of it i mean in a sport that's gotten very serious and like for good reason i mean yeah it's a real deal now and everyone's there to show up and be really focused and yeah do their job well but it's like then there's strider just i feel like you keep the keep us everyone well us when i used to be there but you keep everyone honest on the fun factor and sort yeah. of like the heartbeat of what surfing and I think and surfing is, is, you know, is uh, it, 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 the real premise and, and the real base of it to me is that it's just surfing. So there's no reason to like go too far into any of these things. Like let's come back to the, the nucleus and just re remember and realize that it is just surfing and that the joy of surfing is the most important thing. And it's hard for me because I don't care who wins or loses. I'm there to watch the surfing. Mm -hmm. 
Like to me, it's just about like the fact that I'm, that's who I am. I'm a surfer. I, that's all I am. And everything around it is just because of surfing, right? Like I got the commentating and like being a good dad in like being in, you know, in business and having, you know, my sunscreen company with shade sunscreen, like everything is all because of surfing. So my only real like loyalty is to that. And so when I'm like at a contest and I'm watching these guys surf, when I'm watching you <laughs> get barreled and I'm duck diving through a wave at fucking, you know, inside of J Bay, like I'm just so psyched to watch guys surf. And for the girls surf, like right now, the, to me, the most exciting part of surfing is for the women. Like That's watching crazy. the ladies and how nuts they are and how good they are and like watching the progression of surfing right now on the women's side of things, it's like, I, I could, I've seen the guys do it. I've never seen the women do it and now I'm seeing them do it. And it's just like, it's exciting. You, you really, there's just so much in it. And for me, the whole part of it that's really, <clears throat> and I don't want this to be taken the wrong way, but I'm not there for the contest. I'm there for the surfing. Totally. And the great moments of triumph and like world titles and being able to share those moments with them, I respect those moments and I'm honored to be a part of those moments because they're it's history and these people are working so hard to get to that point. But like watching Stephanie Gilmore rip the shit out of it all the way through the finals at Trestles and then take the win, like, like that surfing to me was just crazy. It's so fun to watch. And like that part of it, I guess, was was really cool in the sense of the competition of it. And but still the surfing was just insane. Do you know what I mean? To oh, watch totally. her like just smash through that. Like Tatiana Weston Webb's 10 at Chopes was just like next level. Like and Sawyer Limblad, like just tippy toeing through a crazy barrel, like first time she's ever even actually like done that and just like watching molly fucking go straight up into sections at like sunset of like yeah. death sections i mean just like so many different like moments of surfing that are just incredible to watch incredible so sick anyway and i and i have like a a surfer's connection to the athletes right like I'm not just a commentator guy. <laughs> I love surfing. I yeah. still surf every day. I'm still like so, and I feel like we have a mutual respect in the water, and I feel like that's shared, and that feels really good too. For sure. I think it's unique that, I mean, I guess I have it in like, you know, football and stuff, and there's other guys like Ross or someone who surfed on the tour, but I feel like you just embody the like, exactly what you're saying like the reason why we all love it i mean maybe not all of us but some of us yeah. of just that pure stoke of serving and you're able to just capitalize on that and in those moments like i i enjoy watching you on the webcast from home and just yeah. seeing how fired up you are on those moments and how it's like not bullshit you're not sitting there going oh my god this is like this yeah. and that you're just like it, Fuck it yeah. is true it is pure <laughs> dude i love it yeah I do. and i think that's you know that's unique and yeah that's why we, that's why a lot of us are here, hopefully. Yeah. I think we'd be doing it no matter what. So yeah. Part, so. Totally. I trip out on that too, though, just in my life, even I'm like fucking surfing. Like how I, I just loved this thing. Like when I, when I was a kid going out and getting a surfboard and just being in this whole other world. And like, obviously I didn't grow up with the childhood that you had, I had a killer family, but it was like still just being out in the water was just like, like well, oh, you, nothing else matters, you know? And there's a lot, there's you know, whether, so like what you just said about like childhood and, and different upbringings and there's <clears throat> the reality of, of that is just circumstantial and in each person's life, the circumstances may be different, but they all still have the same amount of problems. Do you understand what I mean? 
Like we all go through our own shit. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Totally. It might not seem like a lot of something heavy from, you know, from, from other people, but if you took a balance of weight on, on how emotionally it, it affected people, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like for me, I was, you know, I had whatever food stamps and people would make fun of me and I'd be at fucking the supermarket and I'd have to, you know, I was pull out the food stamps and you know, people would be like, Oh, you have food stamps, you know? And I'd be like, oh, yeah, you're paying for this, <laughs> you know? Like, <laughs> yeah. And they'd be like, huh? And they'd look at their mom and their mom be like, cause I remember being at the supermarket and seeing kids from school and their mom, like and then be in, in, in line and I'd be like, pull out the food stamps and they'd be like, you know, laughing at me. And they're like, Oh, so you got food up. stamps, you know? And I'd be like, like, yeah. And, and you paid for them. Thanks. And they'd be like, what? Like, and their mom would be like, Oh yeah, we did with taxes. Like, <laughs> <you know? laughs> but my point is, is that those kind of like circumstances were, were shit I had to deal with. You know what I mean? But then you've got like, people who are who have the means and are wealthy but are in like a situation where something's going on at home and that one little thing because everything else is so good that one little thing can weigh on them just as heavy mm. as my situation totally so the circumstance of life is the same for everybody the weight of life you know what i mean mm -hmm. but once you go surfing all of that shit falls away. Yeah, it's crazy. And just like you said, like you go out in the ocean, you have your own world, and it's scientific. I mean, it's the largest body of negative ions, and it's connected by every ocean in the world. So you have your, the largest entity that there is on the planet that you're tapped into that covers 75% of the Earth's surface, and you're connected by that. Literally riding the energy that's traveling through and the your, whole thing. And the negative ion part of it strips you of all of your thoughts, and you put you in the moment. And that's why, like, when we made that movie about Clay Marzo, Just Add Water, yep. it was all about the effects of the ocean and what that does to your body, and what it does to your mind, and how calming it can be. And surfing is a great therapeutic thing. Yeah, that's so special. It's pretty sick. It's wild too, just chasing that thing that we love. Like you said, I mean, now you're on this, probably a whole other path of surfing that it took you down. You probably never even imagined when you were just riding for Quicksilver, trying to get tube to pipeline <laughs> and it's still going. Still, I'm here doing a podcast. I don't know. <laughs> it's I, it's the of same surfing. thing, dude. We're, we're all, but the, the, the love, the love of, and the most important part of it is, that it's this, the surfing part of it is where it came from. Yeah. And being a surfer used to not be acceptable, even in, even when I was growing up. Like, but now it is. But I finally just you have to. I, I finally was just like, fuck, I'm a surfer. That's that's who I am. I love it more than anything. Why am, I, why am I like trying to be something else? Mm -hmm. Just enjoy that, and then let all these other things that you're doing around it be extra. Heck yeah. Just be a surfer. Fuck it. <laughs> Pretty good thing to be. What, um, like for your kids, Strider growing up or like any, you know, kids coming up and young, whether they want to be a surfer, or anything, you know, what, what would some Strider advice be to them? I feel like you've been pretty true to like, yeah, who I you think, are and chasing after a passion and stuff, you know, and I feel like those are always I think good nuggets to pass on. I think that like I don't know the expectation of success can skew your your view of of life and happiness and I feel like just following your your inside voice and your your thought of like what it is that you want, your dreams, because you can always go back and fall back and get a fucking, go get a job. You can always go do, um, there's always a, a, a plan B or, or a C or a D. There's so many different doors that will open, but I think being true to yourself and know that you tried 
everything that you could do to do what you felt like you wanted to do, not giving up on it until basically you're, <laughs> you know, you're stuck in the dirt. But uh, I, I feel like a lot of people have regrets in life. And I think that dying with regrets is probably the hardest way to die. And you're going to die fast without regrets. Mm -hmm. You're going to be able to just kick out and fucking know that you did everything that you wanted to do. And I think that's the most important part about life because too much of life gets wasted. It's not that long. You don't have, you don't have like a, an, an, an immense amount of time. We're only here for, if we're lucky, you get four snaps. And if, if you're lucky, you know, and that's, you know, 25, 50, 75, you're gone. So like, enjoy them. Like do what you can to live your dream. And find people that want to support your dream. And friends that want to get you to the next level. And try to hang out in circles about the next level that you want to get to. Because if you're sitting back in your hometown and you've got dreams of being something, whether, whether it's an artist or a doctor or a pro surfer, you got to hang out with the people who are progressing in those fields so that you can rise to that occasion. Because if you don't, it's going to be really hard for you to be the one guy that's hanging out with six guys that think they want to do it but aren't really wanting to do it, and you're basically just pulling along that boat. Mm -hmm. You might as well be hanging out with six guys who are going after that dream and working hard to do it. And I think like a perfect example is what's happening in San Clemente. I was just thinking that when you were saying that. You know, you got that group of guys yep. that are all trying to go after something and you can see it work together. You saw the results, you see it. So that's a great example sure. you know, about what I'm talking about. Totally. Yeah. I even feel like that being up from our zone, it's like no one else is, on the tour going that I could go spar and surf with. If my brother's gone, I'm just like, okay, cool. I'm going to go surf and <laughs> it's fun. I love it. But yeah. it's like, you don't have that. When I was doing the tour the last couple of years, I'd just be like, fuck, like, all right, I'm home. Like you have to like, you got to work at it, it on your yeah. own. Whereas like when you're Which around hard. energy, it's like, you're just like, oh yeah, it's like, it's like health. It's competitive, but it's also just like, you just feed off it, I think. And it's, it's, I couldn't agree more. I always felt like that was a challenge from like being up there, you know, it's like, Okay, like who else is trying to do this? Oh, not really anyone. So I'm like, all right, well, I'm just gonna do it. But then you get around it when you're on the tour, and you're just like, all right. Now that I'm off it, it's like I, I realize like that environment that I was in, and just like how it keeps you super sharp, and just like wanting to always keep pushing. Yeah, it's fun. It's it's a trip. I mean, life is fucking hard, and there's there's no easy route, and for I don't think an easy route's a good route. Yeah, I, you gotta anyway. work hard for for everything, and and you like, fuck, man. <laughs> I've been through hell and back, <laughs> and I still, I still, I'm still stoked, just because you have a choice to have. Woe is me. Or fuck it, I'm gonna do this. I'm moving on. Oh yeah. I think you can. You you gotta just find the positive, and, and mindset is everything. And if you if you stay in in negativity pool, your fucking water gets dirty. Septic. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Red tide. So <laughs> just keep looking. Heck yeah. Well, what else? You, what do you got coming up, Strider? And what like I know you got shade going on. Yeah, I got some pretty cool stuff. I sponsored the Colapinto Brothers. I saw that. That's sick. And Congrats. I haven't, I haven't um, 
really put it out there yet. I saw the sticker. Gonna, that was all. Do like a that. press release, and I'm making some signature product for the, their like Cola Bros thing. Cool. Which is really cool, and I'm like about to launch that and like get the hype around it and do the whole like marketing stuff with them. But I'm really excited about that, and the company's doing really good. And uh, I'm gonna go to Fiji with the WSL and do that event, which I'm pretty excited about. Sick, I'll be watching. And uh, I'm hanging with my kids, being a dad, taking them surfing every day and hanging and, and just trying to be there for them and building the house after the fires burned them down. Building back the barn? Yeah, the barn I built back. Okay. And the main house I'm building right now, we're almost, we're getting there. Sick. Which has yeah, been a lot of work. Yeah. Money pit. Yeah. <laughs> um and then going surfing heck yeah i'm gonna just keep going after after bg we're gonna go get the finals at uh actually i'm gonna call a couple of days of the u.s open okay cool because there was like a, a gap where they needed some help because everybody was at the olympics and stuff oh yeah yeah so i'm gonna do a little gap there and then uh i'm gonna go to Fiji, and then I'm going to come back and we got the finals, but I think I'm going to go to Bali in between there, maybe. With some waves. Sounds like a good program. Go Cabo with the kids, want to go to Cabo, so I'll take them to Cabo. Heck yeah. I mean, yeah, there's a lot going on. Yeah. I'm writing a book. No way. Sick. All these stories. Oh man, sign me up. Yeah. Where's, so the, I'm where's up, the pre order? I'm writing a book. <laughs> and I, I got some good ideas for for the book, and uh, I uh, there's some other stuff probably happening with it, which is pretty cool. But um, I'm pretty excited about just that. And then I have another like coffee table book I'm making. I have like all my travels. I've always had a camera. I've got thousands of slides. Oh, dude, I bet. Dude, I got crazy photos. Sick. So, I got to get those out there. Put that on the on the table somewhere. Heck yeah. But I got a lot of shit going on. Yeah. But I, my problem is time management. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, hopefully, back on tour next year. Sure you for will 2025 be. i want to go i want to go back to australia i haven't been in like four years yeah me too so i'm I'll hoping it down there that's something i get to do the wsl better sign me up for australia put, him, put strider <laughs> in guys i'll spend more time viewing <laughs> um, we all will but yeah it's it's interesting this wsl as a broadcast guy like my wife pointed it out the other day because we, we went to a wedding in Santa Barbara, actually in Montecito. Oh, no way. And I went to this wedding and we stopped at uh, my favorite taco shop on the way, El Rincon. Oh, Rincon Altena. So good. Dude, that's like the crispy I could hit you with a rock almost from my house from there. Really? Yeah. I live right up the street. Oh, yeah. Well, hit me up next time. Those crispy tacos. Or next up. They're so, dude, I had those yesterday for lunch. So I went in there and these guys, I had like a suit on and I was like, my wife was in the car yeah, and I was like in the suit and I'm sitting in there just mauling these tacos, Sick. just like full, like, and, and they look, the guys are like looking at me like, fuck man, you, you got like a suit on, but I know you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm all, yeah, maybe. And they're like, are you Strider? <laughs> and it was the funniest thing ever. And they were like so like stoked, you know, like, so like there's these, they were like, you know, whatever, mid twenties, you know, kids, like surf guys, maybe, maybe late twenties. And then Probably my friends. And then, uh, I, I like, you know, <clears throat> I'm like, get, we park in Montecito to go to, uh, the honor bar. Mm -hmm. It's good. My wife and I went in there. She was going to get, uh, we were going to get a drink before we went to the, uh, to the wedding. And this uh, this kid walks by and he's like, "Hey, what's up, man?" And it was just like a grom, you know, like 
pretty much just like 14 or whatever. And then go into the bar, sit down. I'm like having a, a drink and we walk outside and this, this older guy comes up to me. He's probably, you know, whatever, 70, 60, not, not that old. He's probably 60 something. And he's like, Strider, you know, can I get a photo with you? My, my daughter's surf. And like, you know, it was like, so I took a photo with him too. And then like, my wife goes, you know, when you were a surfer, as a pro surfer, people knew who you were. It was cool. But now like little kids and like old people know who you are. <laughs> it's like, she was tripping out on like the, yeah. the like level of like exposure that we have with, through the WSL. For sure. And it's, it's pretty trippy. Like, I'll be in a fucking parking lot in England, and somebody will be like, Strider? That's a <laughs> It's a trip. It's, fuck, it's so weird. But a lot of people are watching surfing. It is. I know. It seems like more and more. It's, uh, we just got to figure out a way to capitalize on it. Totally. Capitalize. Just keep it going. That's all we got to do. Yeah. Keep it going. Always. Well, thanks for coming down, Strider. Yeah, man. Thank Appreciate you. it, dude. Yeah. Safe trip to Hawaii. Yeah, that's going to be fun. Let's surf soon. Definitely.